to also record once um, we come back from a breakout room, if we do do a breakout room. And Ishmael, um, yes, I'm recording this right now. So um, normally we, we, we um, introduce ourselves according to um, where we're from and what brings us here. In this case, um, you know, Ray, the work that you do spans academia and clinical practice and um, facilitation. And so I'm, you know, there's all kinds of directions we could go. And so as we talked about, I'd like to find out really briefly, like take just 30 seconds, because now there are more of us. Um, to say where you're calling from and also um, what in particular you'd like to get out of this. Um, or you can put what you'd like to get out of this in the chat either way. And that will give Ray and I an idea of where to focus um, the interview. And I think there are enough of us where we can go into breakout rooms, um, perhaps even by topic if, uh, if David can manage it. You know, David is not here. So let me do one more thing and send him an invite, which I think makes you jump through an extra hoop, but actually gets you into the, um, the call. Let me invite him in, because he is doing some technical. Work. OK. So um, Joe, would you like to start? Um, yes, um, my name is Jo. I've been to some events with Jill before, or at least one, and I'm trying to think about sort of ongoing conversations rather than one-offs. And actually, I was at the Embodied Summit last week, so I've already met Ray on, on uh, camera before. So I think it's just about linking up the different areas. I'm a clinical psychologist by background. Um, I work in children's services in social care, and I see a major part of my work I'm thinking about anti-oppressive practice with frontline workers. So I consult to frontline workers and that's my thinking, but I, I want to get more in the body and not just other people's, but mine. I realize I've just been away and I'm trying really hard this week to think not I'm busy, but my, my body hurts and listen mm. to it. So I'm but doing a little bit of self-care through this as well. Trying to take it. Well, welcome Joe. Can you clarify what you mean by frontline workers? Um, I guess the people who, like social workers, teachers, people who meet our clients first off and they, the first port of call, whereas I'm a psychologist where we're a bit more background. So they're usually teachers, social workers, sometimes health staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I might have missed something, so please feel free to add in anyone who knows better. If, it, if it's okay, I'm just going to call on people to make sure we go. And feel free to pass. There's no obligation to participate here in any way, shape, or form. And if um, I see you here, I'll ask if you want to participate. It's an invitation, not a demand or any pressure. Jay. Hi, um, I'm Jay. I, uh, I'm originally from Georgia. And... I'm right now I'm in Boston. Um, I'm just interested in learning more and like finding community. Um, I'm really new to like starting learning about anti-racism and um, I've kind of been doing a lot of self-reflection. And so that's what has brought me to like this kind of thing. And I'm very grateful to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Mike. Hi, yeah, so uh, this is my first actual session with Jill. So that was, um, Jill was the reason why I'm here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing Ray, of course, as well, as well as uh, network with all you guys. So my thing is to work, uh, to get anti-racism into workplaces. So uh, I was, uh, I'll keep this brief. Uh, I, I left engineering as a career then re-entered it as a workplace trainer in terms of uh, mental health and well-being. Uh, and then as I was discovering how, uh, how undiverse well-being is, certainly in the UK, I thought, you know, there's something that's got to change here. So 
uh, knowing that, that UK workplaces are pretty racist because they're about uh, uh, history uh, uh, and, and so on. I was like, okay, well, I need to kind of think how am I going to get this message across? If I'm talking about overcoming the stigma of well of uh, of mental of mental ill health, why am I not talking about the stigma of racism? Why am I not talking talk about the stigma of ableism and homophobia and so on? So that's my kind of I've reinvented myself a couple of times in the last three years, uh, and now I'm doing uh, basically workplace anti-racism courses. That's my kind of like, main thing I do now. So I'm very interested what uh, pro culture it means as, as opposed to allyship uh, and just understanding the kind of white anti-racist uh, uh, sort of philosophy approach and how I can uh, embolden that with the people I meet who are both white, black, brown and so on. So that's my, my thing. Thank you. And I will explain pro culture it before we get deeper cool. in. Remind me if I, if I forget that, please. Rachel. Hi. Um, so um, my name is uh, Rachel Harlick. Um, I'm a psychotherapist um, and um, I'm uh, training in a somatic um, therapy, uh, sensory motor psychotherapy. Um, and I work specifically with um, sexual and gender expansive folks. Um, so LGBTQ plus um, kink involved clients, um, sex workers and non-monogamous folks. Um, and so my um, kind of reason for being in the field um, is looking at, um, you know, somatic approaches for people who are living specifically in you know, marginalized, oppressed, stigmatized bodies. And, um, you know, one of my, you know, main questions is why don't we have approaches that are specifically geared towards folks who are enduring those traumas and micro and macro aggressions daily. Uh, so um, I'm, a, a fan um, of Ray Johnson's work and um, really I'm excited to be here to learn from them and with all of you. Thank you, Rachel. And I, um, I felt very enlivened hearing that question. Why don't we have, you know, these approaches and Ray, I think that's what your, you know, your entire body of work has, has been about. And so I, I um, right now that feels like a big portal to want to jump into. So if we can hold that along with anything else that might arise. Um, we. Unmute, okay. Um, I'm Lee Marshall. My pronouns are she and her. I'm in uh, San Diego, California. Uh, and I'm a member of the G uh, LGBTQ community. Um, I have been trying to recover from breast cancer treatment for the last year. And this is the first meeting I've been able to make mm. since last year. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks. Really glad you're here. Ismael, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, you can say um, Ismail or Ismael. So I guess you went with the three syllabus, well done. <laughs> Um, so I am on the unceded and stolen territories of the Musqueam, and Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And uh, colonially speaking, I'm in Vancouver. And um, I work at the University of British Columbia, where I am a, a director of faculty equity. And I also work in the equity inclusion office as an organizational strategist. And the topic of spirituality and mindfulness and awareness and revolution and politics and justice are very interesting for me, um, particularly the, the bringing together of, the, of those two streams. And how does, how does one move in, in the marketplace and be, uh, and cause good trouble, but while also acknowledging the, the non-duality that uh, is underneath all of us. Mm. And, um, so that's kind of like what brings me here today, just listening and learning. I will, 
just very quickly, I will have to step out because I have overlapping meet meetings, but I will pop back in at, at one point. So just to let you know, right? Thank you. Santa. Hi. Um, I am um, familiar, a little bit familiar with Jill's work and evolution. Uh, and um, a little bit recently, um, I think I reached out to Jay and for maybe seeing her pers uh, personally. And then I said something that probably just really turned her off or whatever, like, I'm really not ready. I'm totally freaked and terrified of doing this work. <laughs> so, so I under, I kind of understood, but um, I'm a somatic and creative coach, create, uh, creative inquiry coach. And I recently, Jill knows this, was um, called out for a racist, um, a racist trope that I said that completely, uh, completely unconsciously, completely. And I, I realized that um, it really is a, a body thing and a somatic thing, the implicit bias and the racist conditioning and all that stuff it has nothing to do with my direct experience. Um, so I'm kind of wanting to really dig, you know, whatever it takes into my, uh, into my own soma, into my own dis dysregulated soma mm. and unconscious aspects. So mostly here to listen. Mm. I feel very um, uh, moist and tender inside hearing that and your transparency. Thank you. Regina, would you like to introduce yourself? And things? What, for those of you who arrived later, I, I was the invitation, and it's an invitation, not a demand, not a requirement, um, is to introduce yourself and where you're from. And also just very quickly, what, um, what your orientation is to this work slash what you're hoping to get out of it so we can kind of gear uh, the talk towards that. Uh, thank you, Jill. Um, uh, Santa, yeah, I was also inspired by your transparency and vulnerability. I uh, use she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from um, unceded Ohlone territory, Berkeley, California. And um, I've been doing some organizing with showing up for racial justice surge in um, the East Bay. And I, um, I tend to approach anti-racist work from a very intellectual, let's read history books, let's look at patterns. Um, and uh, this past summer, I went out to support the Line 3 movement blocking the oil pipeline in indigenous territory in Minnesota. Um, yeah, and, and it definitely shifted some things. So I, I have curiosity and openness about this somatic um, approach. Thank you. Thanks, Regina, and welcome. Jeremy? Hi, uh, yes, my name is Jeremy. And um, I'm a graduate student of somatic psychotherapy or psychology at the California Institute for Integral Studies. Uh, I'm also an, an, an intern at the Center for Somatic Psychotherapy in San Francisco. Um, I'm a committed anti-racist and I'm, I'm also committed to social justice. So that's why I'm here for this. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm especially heartened to see an apparently white man here. And I really, really wish there were many more. Yes, I, I wish so too. Trisha. Good morning from uh, central coast of California. I'm on the unceded land of the Chumash people. I use pronouns she, her. 
Um, I did come late. I could not get into this event <laughs> for a while. That's just my my event bright and uh, so yeah, we have we have trouble now and then. But I'm glad I'm here. Um, I did the Embodied Social Justice uh, Certificate Program last year and found that very enlightening. Um, and I just keep wanting to dig deeper into this. To uh, um, I've got a long history of activism in the field of social justice, both as uh, both paid and as a volunteer. And I'm continuing as a volunteer now that I'm retired. And I just want to keep growing. I'm committed. I'm absolutely committed to this work. I recognize it's our work um, as white people. And uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here and glad to be. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Um... Lance, would you like to introduce yourself? So again, there's no pressure, um, no requirement. If you want to introduce yourself and where you're from and what you want to get out of this, um, you're welcome to. So I, I want to say that if anybody who is currently not showing their video would like to introduce themselves, please turn on your video so that we know when I don't you know, call on you unwelcomely <laughs> to coin a word. Selena. Hey, hey, Jill, sorry. I don't get good, very good reception with my video, so that's why I like to keep it off. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Selena, and I'm calling from the um, unceded territory of the Tokabaga tribe that people call St. Petersburg, Florida, um, non-binary, any pronouns work. Jill knows me. I took her amazing course with Dr. Cleo Monago last year. And I have been doing this work for a while. Um, I'm happy to be here. I will say that even in the last year, the hardest place for me to be is with other white bodies around these conversations. And Jill knows that. And it's just because there's so much resistance. And um, my, my strongest work right now that I work with in my community is the anti-capitalist work because you need racism for capitalism and people don't want to hear that right they want to keep their safety their white safety and their riches and um it's just not going to work <laughs> so i'm here to kind of build those bridges and how we can do collective aid and create a world where everybody has equity and equality so no one suffers and then racism i think will naturally once we embody that start to become what it is which is just you know horrible like people will see it so anyways thank you love your fire selena um anybody else who is currently not showing your video currently has video off if you would like to introduce yourself please take please turn your video on and we'll call on you or at least turn your audio on <laughs> otherwise um let's begin let's give it another moment in case someone's trying to turn their video on but anyway welcome Lance and Kate, Sid, Lorraine, Celine, Lakeisha. Oh, Lance, hi. Hi. Um, my name is Lance Freeman. I, um, hmm, I, uh, I'm a certified counselor, um, self-trained. I know Jill from years back. That's pretty much what brought me to uh, the space. Um, growing up in the Bay Area between uh, the vanilla suburbs of Castro Valley and the chocolate city of Oakland has put me in a quite unique space of one foot on the bridge and one foot on the boat kind of doing this and realizing that we definitely don't, we don't solve racism from a mental space. And so um, Reza was, uh, uh, my grandmother's hands was sort of my introduction to thinking, ah, there, there, there could be another avenue towards moving to a place where we actually can feel and own it. And instead of gaslighting the mass, vast majority of our population, believing that racism isn't a thing. Um, so um, I'm uh, here to listen and learn. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jill. So glad to see you, Lance. Thank you for coming. Lorraine. You're on mute. Hmm. 
Let me see if I can unmute you. Oh no, I have to ask you to unmute. There we go. Is that it? Ah, that is it. Okay. I'm Lorraine James. I live in Oakland, California. Um, I'm here because I have uh, two children who are also African American, um, 49 and 44 years old. And I, when I, I, hmm. I thought that I wasn't raised with racism. Um, I was in a little town, no people of color. Uh, but I realized later that we're born into a world actually that swims in uh, racism. And so a lot of what I was unaware of was on, a, on an unconscious level there, just like, like I said, I was born into it. Um, why am I here? Oh, so when I first met my husband, um, ex now, um, I took classes, of course it was back in the sixties, I took classes in, uh, Afro-American culture, Latino culture, you know, lots of different ethnic cultural stuff that was going on at that time, during, uh, schooling in college programs. And sorry, I'm, I'm uh, nervous. <laughs> That's okay, and, Larry, but if you could just give a quick sentence or two about what you hope to get out of today, and then we can jump into it. I just want to, I just want to, uncover, just keep uncovering all of that stuff that's in my uh, subconscious and, and take responsibility for it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate all of you coming here, um, being willing to face this stuff. And I just want to invite you to feel your heart, feel your belly, Feel your spine and feel your connection to the earth and the actual fact of our interdependence with planet earth and the trees that give off carbon dioxide that we breathe and how we, we literally live through and from the earth and that unites us all. Um, even though race is a constructed fiction for the purpose of oppression, its consequences are very real. And that's what we're here to look at from the place of our bodies and our interconnectedness and our feelings of separateness. Um, I, I wanna say coin, but that's not true. I resurrected the term proculturate because I um, also had read Resma Mendicum's My Grandmother's Hands, and he called directly upon white people to create anti-racist white culture. And the create anti was sticking in my craw. I, I, I kind of couldn't get past it for a while. Um, and I thought about how uh, some of the most successful movements um, kind of take the anti thing and turn it around into a pro. For example, anti-abortion has created pro-life. Um, over closer to my corner of the world, uh, anti-rape has become consent culture. And think about it, how many rapists are gonna sign up for a course on how not to rape? Probably not too many, but a lot of them may come to consent culture workshops to find juicier ways to have sex, which by the way, include not raping, right? So um, I firmly believe and support anti-racist measures. And I wanted to find a way to spotlight and elevate, elevate white anti-racists to show ways of being a light-skinned person of European descent that were actually transformative of whiteness. So I found this word hanging out in academia, proculturate, to create culture, essentially. And I, there's a whole article I have on that if you really want to geek out. 
Uh, but I wanted to give you a background. What the heck does that mean? Because it's not actually a word in the English language or it hasn't been. Um, and with that, I'm so excited to welcome Ray Johnson. And, you know, Ray, you're extremely busy and you were kind enough to make time to come and talk with us. Um, and you're a key player in the Embodied Social Justice Summit. You have a book called Embodied Social Justice. You're working on another book, perhaps um, a, a version of that. Um, and what, we, what I've heard just now from all of you is like, a, basically, number one, everybody cares about this. Um, and two, a lot of you are, as Joe put it, on the front lines. Um, and I think, Rachel, you articulated something that seemed like a nice entry or portal, can you remind Ray or Rachel or someone, can you remind me of, of what that was? Because I remember it was really good. Sure. <laughs> Sorry to jump yeah. in, yeah. Yeah, so what I had said was, um, you know, this question that I have um, of why are these somatic therapy approaches not specifically geared toward people who are living in um, marginalized, stigmatized, oppressed bodies, right? Kind of thinking about like moving people on the margins to the center of these conversations. Um, and Ray, before I turn it over to you, I also want to acknowledge that um, I didn't call on you to introduce yourself. <laughs> so if you'd like to do that, you know, before you jump in, please feel sure. welcome. Yeah. So, um, I like your question, Rachel. Um, it's it's a great question, and I and I think that it might um, allow us to begin unpacking and and peeling back some of the underlying premises of uh, a lot of work that that we might otherwise assume to be relatively benign, and then when we start using it and working with with it and seeing the the effects of the tools we're using, we, we come to realize what Audre Lorde realized, which is that we are inadvertently, unconsciously using the master's tools and that they will never disassemble the master's house, right? So I, I, I understand Jill's work and, and a lot of the work of folks who are um, trying to undertake creating culture differently as also simultaneously looking for different tools. So maybe we can spend some time today just together um, discussing what tools seem to have an effect that's different from the profoundly disconnecting effect that so many other tools that we're taught to believe are, are otherwise helpful or benign. How do we, how do we begin to re-equip ourselves, retool ourselves and, and do that in a deeply embodied way, because I think that that's sort of the, and has been the, the focus of my work. Um, so I'll take a step back and just do a little bit of an introduction. Um, my name's Ray. I um, have been doing specifically um, work around embodiment and social justice for about the last 20 years. And I feel like I've just Oh, just scratched the surface, really just, you know, found the, the tip of, a, of an iceberg. Um, and so I'm both um, deeply committed to continuing to work in this area, but also every once in a while, I get a little bit daunted by the scope of the transformation that I believe is, is necessary. Mm. And so, um, I'm gonna back up a little bit and share, um, share just a little bit of my history for those of you who, who maybe don't know it. And I'll start off by saying that um, I use they, them pronouns. I identify as genderqueer and as neuroqueer. And I'll say maybe a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. Um, and that I take um, a very embodied but also very intersectional approach to the work that I do. So I despite the fact that I, that I come out of the queer community, I've, I haven't focused my, my work specifically on homophobia. I, I really have felt as though um, that all of these mechanisms are interconnected. 
and that to be um, to be working to transform a, a system means that both we need to find our particular location, our particular leverage, right? Whatever that is, and and exert some transformative influence there. But also that that ultimately, I believe that taking um, a big picture view and seeing the internet connections actually helps us to work together. And I believe that's the other piece that I've I've learned over the last 20 years is that this is this is not work that it's possible to do on your own. And I believe it's not work that's possible to do in siloed communities. So as much as I, I do believe that specific focus needs to be paid to anti-racism, particularly in the United States, but also <laughs> around the world. Um, I also think that as we, as we work, it, it also helps to notice the, the threads and how these things connect and how in fact, you know, I think someone, someone said that, you know, that racism is necessary for capitalism and so is ableism and so is so many other things. So just to, to let you know that a lot of what I'm speaking about isn't because I'm coming from a, from a, a long focused trajectory around white anti-racism, but really I'm coming from a trajectory of how do we begin to tap into the lived experience of our own bodies mm. to help us undo the unconscious, not always, but often unconscious patterns that replicate the harmful systems that we're in. So that's that's kind of me in, in a in a in a bit of a nutshell in terms of my background. Um, I think I'm gonna, if it's all right with you, Jill, I'm gonna actually take up Rachel's question first. Um, I know that you and I had talked about some questions that maybe would be helpful to, to cover over the time that we have together, but, but let's start with that. Because I believe that the disconnection between those practices that have focused on embodiment and the trauma of oppression, and I really do understand it as a form of trauma, that that's actually um, replicating an old pattern. And, and I think that the, the older and the more perhaps fundamental pattern is the pattern of enforcing, and I, and I use that word quite intentionally, enforcing a disconnect between the lived felt experience of our bodies and our sense of ourselves. So I might, I might describe that as you know, a mind-body disconnect, but I think it's more complicated than that. I think the, the mind-body disconnect is necessary to the person-to-person -person disconnect that oppressive systems um, function to enforce. Ray, could you give any, can you give an example of a disconnect between um, our lived, ex I think what you said was something like lived experience in our bodies and our, our sense, sense of, ourselves? of ourselves, yeah. Sure, um, or I'll say a bit more about it. I'm not sure that I've got an example fresh, fresh at the top of my mind, but, but I'll, I'll speak to it a little more. I, I think that as we are socialized into cultures <clears throat> that are basically um, about divide and control, right? Which I, I think of oppressive cultures as, as being, the, the, the fundamental mechanism is, is divide and, and differentiate based on power and then control those divisions. I think that happens on a body level as well. And there's a, in the West, at least, a really long religious and philosophical tradition from the Greeks all the way through to Descartes, but also woven through Christianity and, and, and other religious traditions, for example, that really vilifies the body. That the body is animalistic or the body is a machine 
the body is something that needs to be disciplined and controlled in order to be acceptable. And that the part of, I'm gonna argue that part of the process of socialization in the West requires us to discipline and control and oppress our own bodies in order to be socially acceptable. Can, can I lift on that a little bit? Please do. I don't know where that echo came from. So um, in my, my schema that I'm working with right now, um, I might refer to what you, the distinction you just made is between external reference and internal reference. And what I mean by that is when we external reference, we um, sort of snap to what we're told we are, what we should, what we ought to be. And internal mm -hmm. reference is what bubbles up inside of us. Like Susan Griffin and her book, The Way of, I mean, her essay, The Way of All Ideology, which really just rocked my world when I discovered in the mid eighties and continues mm -hmm. to. Um, uh, she um, talked about, realizing you know when she was in a marriage with a man realizing that she had feelings for women you mm -hmm. know and so the the external reference but you are a wife you are a you know whatever a good woman is and but her feelings inside were were pulling her in another direction mm -hmm. um it's similar you were a montague and a capulet but yet romeo and juliet found that they loved each other based on their internal body experience and you know that's you know, a lot of great drama um comes from when our what I mean by drama is not like struggle in life, but stories, the stories that we gravitate to a lot of times um, come from when someone is supposed to be or do or act out a certain externally defined role and something in their bodies pulls them somewhere else. They hear a call, you know, and they resist it because they're not supposed to be that. So I think what you're pointing to is just a hugely powerful uh, tension between like what we're externally defined as and told to be. And then on the other hand, what actually is happening within our bodies. Yeah, I, I, I might suggest it's even worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, the, and the way in which I would suggest it's worse than that is, is I think we take into ourselves to our, into our sense of who we are, those ideas that come originally from the outside. And we come to believe that about ourselves. It's not that there's this, um, always this necessarily, you know, deep tension between the internal and the external, but the external actually becomes internalized such that I actually treat myself in a way where my sensory visceral knowledge gets discounted or ignored or shamed. Yeah, 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 I feel you. Um, I wanna check in with you because my original thought was to have um, a conversation between you and me until about right about now, and then go into breakout rooms and then come back. Um, but what I found in the last um, one of these events with Z Gris was that it was a richer experience to have everybody stay um, in the same room. So I want to check in with you and see how you're feeling about that and what you would enjoy. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, the, the thing that, that often works best in these kinds of settings is for us to have a conversation, mm -hmm. not just two people having a conversation, but the whole room having a conversation. So however we do that, and, and I think breakout rooms might work at some point, and, and if, if that's what seems to make sense, we can do that. But um, for sure, I would very much like this to be much more than just what we might think of as an interview. Okay. That's, okay. Yeah, that's, cool. um, that's, I mean, and I think that's part of the, the, the beauty of having folks check in and having a, a room this small yeah. is that we, we now have had an opportunity to hear from folks. And, and one of the things I'm hearing is, how do I have these conversations? How do I, how do I find ways to tap into and act from 
my visceral embodied experience without that being overwhelming to me and the relationship that I'm having, the engagement that I'm having with someone else. You know? Mm -hmm. So I sometimes talk about that as how do we cultivate somatic bandwidth? Mm hmm. Because it's so hard to be in and stay in these conversations without shutting down. Yeah. Or without reacting in a way that has the whole weight of our histories, regardless of our social location, that has the whole weight of our histories coming to that point and that inflection point in the conversation where there's some some tension or some disagreement or some. Um, there's been a microaggression or whatever it is, that it's, it's really difficult, I think, sometimes to hold our own seats. Yeah, and you talk about the, kin you talk about the kinosphere um, yeah. in your book, which I love. And I, in the 22nd Century Leaders Program, I call, just call it our bubble. You know? um, and we spend the first six months of the nine months just working on inner stuff which for some might be counterintuitive, but as you point out, it's the basis. It's, it's yeah. the basis of everything else. And Santa, you had your hand up. Did you, would you still like to speak? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll just blurb in <laughs> here. It's like, um, uh, yeah, from the earliest age, I, or from my teenage years, I realized, um, that there was a mind uh, body split in myself and I have been exploring it. It's been a very strong, maybe the strongest thread through my life. And uh, I just wanna add that, so, um, okay. And I knew very early that like in the seventies and stuff that the body doesn't lie, that the mind has all kinds of, uh, tricks you know but unfortunately being on this end of things i realized that as much as i know no somatically i cannot live from my soma i can't live from i am still being ruled and run by this disconnected uh mm -hmm. mind and uh head and um and when I hear you, Jill, you know, give feedback that's that to me seems really embodied. I'm like just in awe. I have never heard anybody speak that way. You know that um, that's really specific about your internal experience. And I feel like that's you know that's part of what needs to change is the language and. And when it comes to the anti-racism work or whatever, I, I get it that it's unconscious and for me and uh, somatic. And I almost feel like talking about it doesn't work because it, the talking about it gets up here, you know? And um, I feel, yeah, that's, that's enough, so. Thank you. I wonder um, if anybody feels shame when we try to, like when we think about sharing from our insides. Like I was just thinking the other day, I was shamed for crying as a child, I was sent to my room and called little baby Jill in a really taunting voice. And um, I think a lot of us got shamed for having feelings. I've decided I'm going to write a book on, on shame called the shame addiction Ooh. And, just, and just start from the beginning when I, and, and build my storyline because that's the biggest force. I feel like that's run through my, my life and made me small and visible, you know, when I don't think that's exactly who I am, you know, um, of course it's not. Of course yeah. it's not. And it, it strikes me, you know, Ray, what you were saying about the, um, you know, sort of the physical, the body correlates of, you know, living in a system like shame definitely keeps us. It's, it's like a wall keeping us from our feelings. Also, I noticed that 
at least one or two people joined since we started. I wanted to open it up, no pressure, no requirement, but if you would like to, please um, introduce yourselves with or without your camera. So I just want to give it a moment for anybody. I'm sorry, I didn't track um, who joined, but if you joined and didn't get to introduce yourself and would like to, please um, jump on in. The, the question was, where are you here from and what would you like to get out of today? Thanks for that reference, Selena. A great book on shame is called Perfect Pain, Perfect Shame. Lance asks, doesn't shame serve a purpose? Well, so here's um, something interesting about whiteness. Ray, you're, you're muted. Do you want to address that? Because I, I can always talk, but my invitation to myself is to be quiet and let others talk. Um, if it's all if it's all right, um, I think it's a great question, Lance, and and I would I would love to respond to it. Um, I I think that my my understanding of shame is that it can function primarily to remind us of the social norms in the, of the culture that we're living in. And sometimes those social norms are harmful and sometimes they're helpful. So I think that's part of how shame can get tricky is because sometimes when someone does something that's hurtful, I mean, you can all maybe think of this as a child, as you were growing up, if you did something that was unkind or cruel or selfish or whatever, that, that you might have experienced being shamed by others as a course corrective, if that makes sense. That, that shame, and, and I, I don't know many people who are talking about it this way, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm a bit out on a limb here, but I actually think that, that socially, shame can serve a, a pro-social function. It can help us get along with one another better because we have this uh, of feeling bad when we've done something wrong. The problem with shame is that it's also utilized to get us to conform to social norms that are inequitable and unjust and harmful in and of themselves. So to be shamed for how I look or the way that I move or what community I come from or how much money I have or you know the list goes on. To be shamed for my social identities and locations or the characteristics of my body is never going to be helpful. It's actually used as a tool to um, maintain inequity and to maintain oppression. So shaming I think often and, and, and working through and, and getting in touch with our, our own shame often really does bring us in direct touch with all of those messages that we got about who we are or about who other people are that in fact are not, are not messages that we want to believe in. They're not in alignment with our values and our principles. They're not in alignment with equity or justice. Yeah. But on the other hand, every once in a while going, you know, that was, I did a shameful thing. That was, I'm ashamed of myself. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's been a useful question to ask. Are there things that I've done that I actually feel ashamed of because they were counter to the things that I believe in? People are making oh, distinctions in the chat yeah. between shame and guilt guilt being the thing that happens when we do something bad and shame mm -hmm. being something that can kind of permeate and live at the core. And I also want to check, Selena, um, you had your hand up and then Joe, so did you. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I just love what uh, Dr. Johnson just said in this discussion because I think especially, you know, I grew up in a white family in the Midwest and I knew in my body, I must have done this work in a past life. I knew in my body from a very young age, I could feel the racism when it was presented around me. 
so I was kind of always like ashamed just being white in a white town with white, just, just ashamed, right? Just like embarrassed. <laughs> That's probably why I left when I was 17. I was like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Going to go to a coast. Anyways, the, I think it's already been addressed, but the, the difference between like shame and regret, right? So the shame is kind of like a sticky feeling. It's, in the, it's just weird. It's just programmed from birth almost. And regret is seeing yourself and something that you did and saying, okay, I regret this action and I'm going to change it. And one of the things I loved about Buddhism when I was drawn to it at 22 years old was the distinction there is that we don't do shame in Buddhism because it has no function other than to create more problem. But we do do regret and we see ourselves and we say, you know what, this is something that I don't need and it's not beneficial to myself and others. So I think that actually, you know, Dr. Johnson just talked about that, that shame is something that is, you know, kind of a delusion that um, we're indoctrinated with and regret is actually feelings of, you know what, I need to, to change and be better. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Joe, did you want to say something? You're still muted, Joe. Sorry, I was responding um, to Dr. Johnson's comment about being out on a limb because it's something that I had very much connected with that idea about shame is about that sort of not just the corrective and disconnecting um, relationship, and I think primarily in the <clears throat> early relationship with usually a parental figure, but also about the importance of repair, because actually we're not in connection with our significant people all the time. We constantly have these disconnections, and then the focus is about not do you never have disconnection, but can you repair that? And I feel like this is an area that we've been particularly poor at in the area of something like racism, but shame could have a positive function if you are actually working on that repair. So that, and that does come from a body of knowledge, which is, I don't know if you know the term weird, it's like based on, I think, white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic bodies of knowledge, which I love because it's a nice way of saying there are lots of other bodies of knowledge and let's explore those. So it, it does come from that place, but I find it something, maybe food for thought. Can we take a very quick bio break? I mean, if nobody else needs to, I'll go and you guys can, you all can continue. Happy to take a break if, if, um, if folks would like and come back in. What do you think, Jill? How about four minutes? Should we make that it works. spacious and call it five? Yeah, spacious. All right, I'll all see right. you very soon. Okay. Lance says Zo. <laughs> All right. I'll see you.
I don't know what time it is. I mean, I don't know how many minutes have passed. I think I think we're probably pretty close to our five minutes. Thank you for suggesting an extra minute. I actually got a bite of food, which my body is happy about. Yeah, great. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering if I could um, maybe just tie together some of the threads of the conversation that we've been having about shame and guilt and regret and and all of the rest of it. It's a, it's a very rich territory um, and, and connect it back to this idea of somatic bandwidth. Mm, beautiful, thank you so much. Yes, please. Because I think one of the things that can happen with certain kinds of feelings in our body, and I, and I wanna say feelings in our body rather than emotions, because I think when we use the label emotions, we have a, a certain idea of what that means that can sometimes not actually be particularly embodied. So I, I want to actually suggest here that emotions are actually a particular kind of bodily sensation. They're, they're actually things that happen to us on a bodily level that we've learned to categorize in a particular way. So and I, and I think most of us tend to, to think about emotions as different from sensations, but I'm gonna argue that they're just, emotions are just a type of sensation. And that when sensations become overwhelming, we disconnect, or it's one of the things that we can do is disconnect. And I think that that's one of the things that can happen with shame. Hmm. If we don't have the somatic capacity to feel the sensation, the bodily sensation of shame. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that as I'm speaking, you, you're all able to go, yeah, I know that feeling in my body, that cringe and curl up and wanting to disappear and the, our stomach plummeting and our face getting hot. I mean, there's all of these somatic responses that go into that experience that we've learned to call shame, for example. That, that one of the ways that we can cultivate the capacity to be with one another when hurt or error or bias or harm has been done, right? Because this is necessary. It's necessary for, for us not to disconnect from one another in order to sustain some kind of potential resolution of the harm that's happening. But, and I think particularly as, as white folks, it can be really easy to have a very narrow bandwidth, a very narrow capacity to tolerate things like shame, for example, right, or guilt. And I think one of the ways that we can begin to build more capacity so that we're not overwhelmed, so that we don't have this sort of necessary compulsion to revert to blaming the other or continuing to shame ourselves, but in a way that doesn't actually allow us to be in the conversation anymore. But one of the things that we can do outside of those conversations as our own um, commitment to this work is to actually learn to be with all kinds of bodily sensations. I actually think that committing to expand our ability to be with sorrow and grief and rage and pleasure is it's all the same piece of work. We're, we're learning how to be with without being overwhelmed by Mm -hmm. the bodily sensations that arise when we are in experience with ourselves and with others. And it's like homework. We can do it at all, we can do it at all times. We don't necessarily even have to do it in the presence of other people, at least initially. That with practice, with sometimes some guidance, some support, we can actually expand that bandwidth so that the next time, and I'm gonna use an example that, that as, a, as a white body person, of course, 
I feel a, a particular um, responsibility to prepare for, which is the next time I'm in a situation where I've done something out of my white privilege that is unkind or unjust or unfair or ignorant, and that's brought to me that I can actually tolerate that experience. Mm -hmm. That I'm prepared to not abandon myself or the other person. And so for me, that's the practice. The practice of being with my own sense bodily sensations in a way that doesn't um, make them wrong, that attempts to make meaning of them in a context that includes an understanding of the dynamics of power internally and also relationally in my, in my relationship with the human environment. Mm. Right, so. We get so that. <laughs> What's that, Senta? Did you get that? <laughs> Did I write it all down? I was trying to write some of the key points, even though there's yeah. a, the transcription. Just are we going to get? I just love. Yeah. I mean, we're are gonna, you going to get? Are you going to? You going to master this before the end of today's event? Is that what you're asking? Well, no, just that we get a recording or something of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so beautifully put. So I just I want to reflect back some of um, what I heard you say, sure. Ray. Um, and some of it I'm just going to read <laughs> that you talked about developing somatic capacity so that we can be with yes. what's happening rather than shaming or blaming ourselves and each other. Be with. And when I hear that, I think of them. Um, I, I use the word being withness. I think it means the same thing. I think of fully inhabiting our what you would call kinosphere. I've just been calling it bubble, but expanding our 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 presence, our our, our awareness, um, so that we're not actually leaving. We're not leaving our bodies in shame, hiding you know hiding out into the ground mm -hmm. or going up into the stratosphere or attacking the other person, which mm -hmm. is also a form of abandonment of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're abandoning the connection, and we're going into some kind of pattern. Right. Or if we're fawning, if we're if we're we've if we abandon ourselves to trying to please another person, that's also a form of um, abandonment. And so you're talking about increasing this somatic capacity, increasing this capacity of our bodies and also of I, I think our our awareness, which to mm -hmm. me isn't located for me personally, isn't located in just my mind. It's also my heart, my belly and my, my brain and like my, my eyes, where am I able to focus? What am I able to see, perceive with all my senses mm -hmm. um, and not, not take it personally, which I think is kind of a form of shame. It, it usually takes a linguistic form or some other form, but I think it, it, it ultimately feels like the conduit is shame, um, but like to say, oh, I said that thing and then, ugh. I regret that without, oh my God, I'm a bad person. And now I'm incapacitated and I've gone into the, um, uh, I am a piece of shit around which the universe revolves formation. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. <laughs> Cause it's still yeah. all about me, even though I'm talking about what a piece of shit. I am. <laughs> right. That, that, that when we're overwhelmed, it can be very difficult to stay connected to ourselves and to the other. Do you have, um, Ray, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have a go-to exercise or practice that you offer in workshops for, for how to do that? I have, I have lots of them, Jill. So <laughs> there's, there's no one sort of magic bullet here. Um, and I really do think that it's a practice. Yeah. And it's a practice that um, I try not like, like so many practices, you prepare before you're in the field, right? Yeah. yeah. And I'm some ready. of the, some of the practice can actually be after something has happened. 
something that's been troubling or shaming or agitating or enraging or whatever it is, or you know, has filled us with grief or a feeling of loss, that afterwards, if we're not actually able to process it and metabolize it and engage it in the moment, that there's still lots of opportunity to come back mm, mm, with ourselves. Yeah. And yeah. go, can I, can I, and and um, the somatic experiencing work um, has, a, has a beautiful concept of, of titration. Can I, can I give myself some room to be with without trying to change, without trying to manage, without trying to interpret or analyze? Can I give myself a little bit of space now that I'm away from the overwhelming interaction that happened? Can I give myself a space to feel a little bit of that? Mm. 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 Thank you. A yeah. little bit of that. And as soon as I start feeling overwhelmed, like I can't handle this anymore, or the feeling is bigger than me, just to pause and to breathe. And so here's the, here's the practice, Jill. Pause and breathe. Yep. And as you did with us all at the beginning, find some ways to ground and center and orient. And so those are my three go-tos. You can do it however you want, but grounding often helpful, put my feet on the ground, feel my connection with the earth and imagine roots going way, way down deep into the earth. And anchoring. Yeah. But also centering so that it's not just my connection with the earth through my feet and through my legs, but also all the way up into my spine. And this idea that center is not a still point. Center is something that you actually can play with and I recommend playing with it in and through movement. Center is something that changes. And so can I find a place where I feel in balance? Side to side and back to front. And maybe just do this or feel into it as I'm, as I'm saying the words. What might a little more centered feel. And then can I take another nice, soft, easy breath again? Mm. And then what's happening in my voice? What's happening here in my throat? Because this is one of the places where we stop feeling is right here, right? So if I pause long enough, it, now is my throat and my voice okay? And how's my heart doing? And that if I take the time to do those things, and then if I can actually also be with the world around me, not because embodiment's not just all inside, it's also in relationship. So as I'm pausing and connecting, getting grounded and centered, also oriented to the outside world, can I look around? Am I hearing, am I still hearing things? When I breathe in, can I smell anything? Like, am I attuned to the environment? That practice, and then maybe a little bit more of that feeling that I was having a hard time with. Mm. Oh, I love that. So you're um, talking about kind of a, I'm, I'm seeing it as like a figure eight, like going, um, and I see you, Regina. Um, <laughs> going yeah. into like when something overwhelming happens to go back into the titration process like going back into oneself and putting attention to what's happening in the heart what's happening in the throat and you I think what you're describing is expanding our, our somatic capacity is that right it, through these? It, it's it's all of it yeah. going into the sensation and then learning how to be with the sensation without being overwhelmed. Yeah. And the longer we're able to be with sensation by, by going back and forth between the sensation and then other qualities of embodiment where we feel grounded and centered and oriented. Because here's the ultimate goal here is that we, in those moments, where something has happened and we're in 
conflict or distress or you know we're in the middle of those very difficult conversations what we want to be able to do is be with ourselves in our sensations and not disconnect from the other mm, mm, mm. love that thank you for painting that picture and also what i feel in my body is is permission permission to attend to myself rather than just like react immediately or do what's expected it's necessary yeah yeah it's necessary because if if all i do is react but i react in a way that abandons me then my reaction is not going to be informed by what's what's real and true and in and, and integrity and that's real connection i, I agree, yeah. yeah yeah i agree with you and we didn't get taught this i didn't get taught this growing up no, no one cared if i abandoned myself so i appreciate what feels like yeah. huge permission and invitation to not abandon myself yeah yeah and regina yeah, yeah. you've, can, you've had can your I add, yeah. yeah sorry can i add one more thing regina before before we get to you um so we've been talking about somatic bandwidth, this ability to be with increasingly big, intense, deep sensation without abandoning ourselves or others. And then I think the next piece is to be with one another in a way where we are fully present to ourselves and to them, and that in those interactions, we actually begin to allow some of the other into us. Mm. It's not just about me being in myself and you being in yourself, that in that process where we, where we are both fully present to ourselves and the other, an exchange mm. takes place. Yeah. I take you in. I can't take you in if I've abandoned myself. The best that can happen when I've abandoned myself is that I let you invade. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as um, one of the things we talk about, it's a term I borrowed from a, a fellow dancer, Basin Branch Herbertson. He talks about sovereignty and resonance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love yeah. those words. So anyway, I didn't, I didn't want to wind up off on another path and not, not say that we don't stop at somatic bandwidth. The purpose of somatic bandwidth is to be deeply with one another in ways where we actually let the other safely in. Mm. Mm. And we are available to the other so that they can safely take us in. And if we're gone, they can't do that. Um, okay. Thank you, Ray. What did you say about? Uh, Hang on one sec, Santa, because um, Regina has had her hand up yes. now for, for just many that minutes. last sentence. The last sentence. The best I can do when I abandon myself is let you invade me. Invade. Even Thank if you. that's not your intention. Right. And we know this experience. We know the experience of experiences invading us, and they're in us, and then we can't. It feels like they're, they're not even almost ours, but they're living with us. They've taken, they've occupied us. Yeah. And it's how socialization happens. The world gets in, in a way where we've had to abandon our choice about what we take in and what we don't. And that's how we live with the world inside us in ways that are harmful to us. Yeah. Sorry, Regina, you've been so patient. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, no, no, not at all. Actually, I feel like my question has evolved a little bit. Okay, yes, good. I had my hands up. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I am a person who's always really struggled to connect to the somatic modalities. And for me, my anti-racist work, like I just, I can't help but to have like numbers of budgets and footnotes from books and conver you know, conversations about race from high school, just like popping like it's all just so like verbal visual connecting to um you know kind of social historical patterns um and I, I guess like so I think there's an element of like what advice what perspective do you have for people who 
don't usually get those feelings in their stomach and throat. Um, and then I'm curious, I don't know if there's sort of like a neurodiversity perspective that like some people are just, they're not going to have somatic emotions. Um, yeah, I, I just love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I would argue that um, interoceptive awareness, although it has a very um, normal and quite a wide range. What was that? Uh, interoceptive. In, interoceptive awareness. And so, can you define that? <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm just about to. Interoceptive <laughs> awareness is the ability to notice the sensations inside us. Mm -hmm. We all have interoception. We can't function without it. Mm -hmm. Because although we've been talking mostly about the kinds of, of interoception that um, are related to emotions, there's all kinds of other interoceptive processes that happen all the time. It's the way that we know when we're hungry or tired or um, when something's too hot or when we're thirsty, right? And there's a, um, as I said, there's a, a really wide range in terms of how much of that we're paying attention to and able to tap into and feel at any point in time. And it's cultivatable, right? So uh, um, me just noticing your, 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 your chat and thank you for saying that because yeah, it's, the range is is quite wide and there's no I mean I think there I think there can be sometimes challenges all across that continuum there are people who have very strong sensations all the time and one of the things that can happen is those sensations become alarming or they drive the person right so I think what what tends to make a difference is not how much sensation we have, but our capacity to be with that sensation in a way where we can still breathe, you know, to be accepting of that. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that into the room, not just as a concept, but really modeling that. Mm. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to veer us off in a, um, a little bit of another direction because I think it's so important to this conversation of of, of anti racism, um, and and all kinds of all kinds of other social justice work we may be doing. Is that it's often difficult, I believe, to feel our privilege. That privilege can feel like regular. It can feel like comfortable. It can feel like numb. We're not getting these big signals of, whoa, what's up here, <laughs> right? We're blithely carrying on in a way that just feels unremarkable. And it isn't until we get feedback from the environment that that in fact, that our, our blithely continuing to do the way we've always done um, it's not until someone says, hey, that wasn't okay, or that hurt me, or that was insulting, or demeaning, that we go, oh, wow, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't getting in any internal signals that there was anything wrong here. So I think that's the other um, practice that's worth cultivating. And it's harder to do because we're not getting often the same kinds of internal signals that let us know that something's wrong. And so can, can I can I jump in with you? Sure. Yeah. Oh, just as ask about this in relation to voice privilege. Um, let me come back to that. Um, I was thinking about. So in college, somebody asked, so a young man asked me to explain sexism to him. And that I was more attuned to sexism and feminism, I think, than I was to race issues yep. for a time mm -hmm. there. And mm -hmm. I said, it's about space. It's about assuming that women don't have space. It's about lack of space on the boardroom, access to space. 
And, um, and I was thinking about how when African people were stolen and enslaved, they did not have body autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, they were not seen as fully human and were constantly invaded, hurt, humiliated, ripped apart from families. Um, and in, here in the US, we have this legacy, this history, yes. um, no matter where a white person came from or whether their ancestors enslaved someone, um, there's, we have this sort of ancestral form that we occupy, meaning a white body, a coded white body and a coded black body. And I wanted to share, I don't have the footage, but I mean, this was years ago, but um, Dr. Cleo Minago, who I run the 22nd Century Leaders Program with and work with, made a, um, a video, he's made different videos, but this one was of a, a group of black people um, who were talking and laughing with each other, several, like four or five black people. And you could see the, the um, you have in, in your book, like a, a kind of a mapping movie. You could see the range of movement, like people extending, moving their heads, moving their arms several feet. Um, and he slowed it down so you could actually see the rhythm and the length of the movements of the arms extending and the heads moving. And then, <sighs> this is hard for me to face as I say it, because it's something I can't do anything about. So I feel a sense of, powerlessness but then a white person came into the space and he played that same slow down movement again and what happened was you can probably see where this was going the movements got of the black people got smaller mm -hmm. their kinesthetic sphere got smaller their bubble their space got smaller they were not as free yeah and it's heartbreaking to me to face that i don't like it um, what it means is that my coded white body can cause pain just by being in the space. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard, that's hard to be with. Um, and it's hard to hold along with, oh, I want to be close to you as a person. Is that going to hurt? Is it going to be like a porcupine where we try to get close and like quills sticking? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I I would, I would say that that's the other practice to, to first practice being with our own feelings and sensations so that we, we can be with others without abandoning ourselves or without abandoning them. But also in this, in this realm of becoming more attuned to, more aware of our own privilege, and our own implicit bias, that requires a different kind of interrogation. So in the first one, I often say, start, start inside. But with, with the other, I often say, start outside. And one of the things that um, we know from the nonverbal communication literature is that the thing that you just described, Jill, which was that, that constriction, mm -hmm of movement expression mm -hmm. when a member of an oppressive social group is in the, is in the space, that that um, absolutely is, is across all kinds of social um, categories of difference and all kinds of social locations. And that one of, one of the things that happens is something that they describe as asymmetrical interactions. So, Give me a minute and I'll unpack what I mean by that. An asymmetrical interaction is when I, as someone with privilege, have access to a different set of movement behaviors than does someone with less power. Mm -hmm. So typically that means, and these are across four or five different categories, I get access to more space and I can control what's in that space. So my kinosphere is bigger. And when I walk through a room, people move out of the way, right? And conversely, when I have less power and I walk into a room and someone with more power comes toward me, I'm expected to make way, right? This is across cultures through, throughout time, lots and lots of very, 
highly ritualized examples of the ways in which we learn to be with one another through our nonverbal communication that reinforces these power dynamics, these inequitable power dynamics. And that's part of why I think it's so important that, that social justice work includes the body, because I think we're reproducing inequitable social systems from the body up as well as from the top down. That it's not just about the laws and the institutions and the communities and the organizations, it's also about how we interact with one another non-verbally that replicates these power dynamics. I can, I can take up more space. I have access to a wider range of expression. I can use direct forceful movements. I can put my chest out and my chin high versus collapsed and you know this deferential posture of tucking my head and collapsing my, my shoulders and making myself smaller. I can use eye contact differently. If I've got more power, I can look straight at someone and have an expectation that they will lower their gaze. For example, I can, I can touch someone casually. I can reach out and touch them on the shoulder or touch them on the arm. Or in more egregious examples, I can touch a black person's hair or I can touch a pregnant woman's belly, right? Access to other people's body through touch that is not reciprocal. Joe asks about voice privilege. Yes. Um, the person with the most power in the room gets to talk the most. That's for sure true. Yeah, and we will let them go on and on and on. Hope I hope I'm not doing that, but still, yes, you're absolutely right, Joe. That is that we can we can take up time space. Mm -hmm. well, let me yeah, ref, let me reframe that. We're here to hear you. <laughs> yes, no, I was I was kind of kidding, but yes, it, it but it is also true that. I'm sure we've all been in a meeting or in a social situation where the person with the most power sucked all the air out of the room, mm -hmm. took all of the available airspace because they just thought they could, because they'd been socialized to believe that that was their prerogative. And we need what? to stop that. One of the ways I got to my own gender queerness, which I'm kind of reframing as just a different way of being a woman, um, is that back in the days when news groups were first happening, I would show up and, you know, with my name, Jill Nagel, and I would, um, I would talk the way that I talk, which was confident and kind of a know-it-all and articulate. And people would start accusing me of being a man masquerading as a woman. And I'd say, no. <laughs> but I would notice that, you know, lots of situations where I would take up space in ways that other women wouldn't. Um, and when there wasn't a, vis a visual cue, people would say, oh, he must be just faking it. He's really a man. I'd be like, huh? <laughs> yeah. I didn't understand why more women weren't taking up space in the way that I was. And that led me to think, oh, it must be gender queer. Or maybe I'm just a woman with chutzpah. So enacting the nonverbal behaviors of someone with power was interpreted not, oh, there's a powerful person, but they, they must be, they must somehow have a gender that's associated in our minds with power. They must be really a man rather than expanding their notion of what a woman rather was. Than Selena, a powerful woman. Right. Selena, you had your hand up. Do you still want to say something? Okay. No, I was just clapping, Jill, saying, yes, oh. you have good spot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yeah, that idea of, of taking up space has been something that um, all my life has been a big part of it. And that's, I think I, that's why I realized I was genderqueer at 12 or 13, because I was so different than all the other feminized bodies around me. So loud, you know, took up space, was always saying what nobody wanted to hear, 
my, my male teachers, when I was like in the third grade, they couldn't even take it. And I was one of their smartest students. And I think that's what irritated them the most. So you're not alone in that. And I think that breaking down the gender, just like race. Um, can I ask a question to Dr. Johnson? Is that okay? Of course. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if we were just randomly taking questions. Um, so I went to the Embodied Social Justice uh, Summit. I've done this like a third one, and I'm a huge fan of, of Red Dominicum and, and Rev Angel. They're like big mentors for me. And being a Buddhist, uh, Rev Angel is like a huge mentor, you know. And I was raised in a very, very white sangha, even though our teacher's Tibetan. It's it's kind of you know weird the stuff that happens when Westerners get a hold of something. Um, so I had a question, something recently in one of, and I know everyone's different. And as you mentioned, there are many ways to do this work, yeah. but one of yeah. the present, the presenters, and I loved, I was irritated by some of the presenters and I love some of them and it was all good, right? Regardless, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. the yeah. irritation helped me, all of it helped me. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody was talking about going, you know, ending racism and, and so much about this, um, conflict kind of between, something that y'all hit this weekend about kind of ending this, like who's more woke, right? Like who's got the juice and who doesn't? And this mm. idea of ending racism as not being something that's uh, like, we don't see color, right? Cause that's just kind of a line that's been said, but as how do we actually bring an end to this in our bodies when, why, one of the reasons I get so frustrated with other white bodies doing this work is they can't see themselves and spiritual work helps us see ourselves mm -hmm. in a bigger picture like you've been talking about but my question to you is since you've been doing this so long and I know Jill has been doing this so long and and one of my biggest weaknesses is this great beautiful patience mm -hmm. because I do not understand my loves why nobody can see themselves and especially those who kind of grew up in a generation where the civil rights were such a big thing. And so some of my heartbreak comes when I encounter people that are kind of, you know, based, I'm gonna say this over 40, and I'm not saying people are under 40 are racist, because I know that they are, is that I don't understand what happened in the seeing of themselves, of that that there's a there's a traumatic cutoff. And so I have this lack of patience and I'm working on this as a Buddhist and as a som somatic practitioner, like get patience, Selena, go in your heart and have the love because I see this almost veil over the white eyes of like, they don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. And, and I have, I have work to do. That's why I'm here because I don't understand why the pain is so deep that we just can't see the truth. And history keeps repeating itself. You guys, it's not hidden, all right? White supremacist colonization has been going on for thousands. Maybe it wasn't white always, but thousands of years. So what do you do with your brothers and sisters who are your age that you know have been doing this for round and still round and still they were like, racism is solved. <laughs> like, yeah. how do you do it, Ray? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a couple of questions. So uh, I'll, I'll speak to one that, that I'm hearing and, and I'm not entirely sure that, that you, you've asked it quite so directly, but how is it possible that so many people with obscene amounts of privilege relative to others could fail to understand the harm that's being done by continuing to um, pretend that they don't have privilege and that everything's fine. And although I would, I would never equate the harm done by racism to the harm that white people experience living in a racist society, I'm, I'm going to suggest that that there is, there is a way in which, of course, if we live in an oppressive society, we, we feel the impact of that, even if we're blind to it, if that makes sense. That, that we know that we're not living in a world where everyone is equally able to be who they are safely without threat of violence or repercussions and that it has an impact. 
and and I, I think that that there's there's that there's that I don't want to look at this this sort of this denial, um, but but also that there's this idea that giving up privilege is going to result in a world where I have less rather than a world where everyone has more. That there's this zero sum game attitude, right? And that if, if I give it away so that you can have more power, so that you can have more access to resources, so that you can have equal opportunity, that I will have less. And it's, 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 a, it's a belief that is promoted by folks who are very invested in having a whole lot of power. And not, not interested in sharing. So I, I, don't, I don't know, Selena, if that, if that helps answer that, that first part of the question. But the, the second part of the question is like, how do, I, how do I stay patient, right? How do, I, how do I stay in the work without just getting totally disillusioned and burned out and, and frustrated? And I am, I am actually old enough so that I've seen, I've seen revolutions fail, to put it, to put it bluntly, right? Um, and, and the way that I, shift away from that sense of, oh my God, we're not making enough progress and why is this so slow and why am I so ineffective <laughs> and you know my, what's happening to us um, is to, to return my attention to the endless opportunities for micro-sociological change the endless opportunities for connection and resistance and, and um, transformation of patterns that I experience every single day. I'm experiencing it in, in, in this virtual room right now. That, that every time I feel a connection or something land or someone breathe a little deeper or thank you, Jay, or someone put a hand up and go, yeah, that for me, that's the work. So how I manage it is not to lose sight of the big picture, but to also recognize in the, in the spacious present, there's no end of opportunity for transformation. There's no end of opportunity for connection and justice and love in these ways that I think we've been taught don't count, like they're not big enough, they're not splashy enough, they're not impactful enough. But I actually think that's how we come to heal the disconnection is in these little moments where, ah, we just said something that I felt true for, for each of us and we both survived. Oh good, let's do that again, All right? Let's have another, if we can, another authentic moment where there's some truth spoken, some truths spoken. And these, these practices that you talk about, Ray, these, I think these self-connection practices um, can, Tokopa Turner in her book, um, Belonging, said something that just is still reverberating with you, which is um, something like our inner worlds are a macrocosm of the outer world, not a microcosm, because that's what would seem more intuitive, but a macrocosm. And so, Selena, right, if I'm you, or if I'm me, let's say, and I'm doing this interconnection work, and then I find myself standing at a bus stop or hanging out at a family reunion with, you know, with Uncle Fred, who says, you're the one who's racist because you just keep bringing this up. You know, mm -hmm. if I have done this work and I can present to Uncle Fred or somebody else's Uncle Fred, you know, a coherent inner field where I'm not reproducing an outcast part of myself in the form of him, but I'm actually including him in my field of love as I include myself. 
and I ask him a transformative question. We don't even know. You know, Uncle Fred may, this may have planted the seed in old Uncle Fred, and he may walk away changed. We don't necessarily see all the effects of this kind of showing up that we do. As you were saying, Ray, they might seem small, they might be micro sociological, and we don't even know what the effects are. But if it's true that our inner selves are macrocosms of the outer world, then we may be able to bring a transformative moment to somebody who is running a racist program. And that's what I see. It's like, it's, it's held in place with trauma. And if the more that we work, heal our own trauma and we bring that presence to somebody else, we may have inadvertent, or we may have in passing, I'll say, in that moment of connection, created enough space for Uncle Fred's trauma to unravel just a little bit. And that might be it. You know, Cleo Managua has this way of just asking a question, just kind of pulls on this one tiny thread that kind of helps the, um, the misconceptions unravel. And I think the more we can be, have a settled body, the more we can kind of clean out and expand and work with our own bubble, our own chemosphere, the more potentially healing we can be to others who may be harboring racist attitudes that's held in place with trauma. So we have six minutes. I'm wondering if there's anybody who, who hasn't spoken or hasn't spoken very much. Would you like some encouragement to step forward and say something? Well, so right, do you want to say any, and feel free to jump in and interrupt me because I only gave a fraction of a second there. Um, do you want to say something about the Embodied Social Justice Summit? I noticed that you're at the center of it. I wonder if this was your brainchild. I wonder how you feel about how this has unfolded over the last few years. Is it what you expected? Is it going in a direction that you are in favor of? Any surprises? Um, yeah, thanks, Jill. Um, one of the things that has been really heartening for me, I mean, I started doing this, this work, really connecting embodiment with, with social justice um, sort of unconsciously many, many years ago, but really explicitly as, an, as, a, as a researcher about 15 years ago. And when I first started doing this research, I couldn't find anything written. I couldn't find anything written about how oppression was traumatic, never mind the importance of, of the body in doing social justice work. So, one of the things that, that feels really true for me about the Embodied Social Justice Summit is that it's remarkable how many folks have come to that intersection kind of on their own. I could just, it seems to be in the air. And um, really, um, really heartened and really impressed and really encouraged by the, by the number of folks who are not only coming to these realizations themselves and doing their own really good work around these issues um, and writing about it and presenting on it and doing the work in communities, but, but also how there seems to be, dare I say it, a little bit of a critical mass. Like, <laughs> it, it might be a little bit premature to say, but we've almost got a field. We've almost got a community of practice. And it's happened very quickly um, over the last, I would say, five or six years. And increasingly, we're looking at, at this work globally and recognizing that, for example, there are indigenous traditions that have been doing this work for you know, centuries and centuries and starting con to connect the work that's being done in the West um, to work that's being done in the global South or in indigenous communities. So, that for me is is exciting to see. Me too. Thank you. I just put the link to the Embodied Social Justice Summit. Um, we're going to have people, somebody asked about Dr. Cleo Minago. We're going to have an Ask Me Anything with him coming up in mid-March. I'll um, 
uh, invite you to that. If you haven't, um, if you didn't sign up with this through Eventbrite and you want to be on my mailing list, um, you can email me. I'll put my, or you can just go to um, evolutionary work place.com slash events. Ray, do you have a mailing list? No. Okay. You can just find her on the internet. Um, we just have two more minutes. Um, so it says, thank you for allowing me to be with witness, listen and learn from the exchanges here without having a need to speak. Yes, your silence, your presence. Very, very welcome here. Thank you, Sid. Um, Ray, thank you so much. I know how incredibly busy you are and the, I'm just so grateful for the contributions that you're making. And when, when can we look forward to your next book? Um, my next book will be out um, spring of next year. I'm working on the manuscript as we speak. The deadline is ticking, ticking loudly in my ears. Um, and it's going to be a much more practical, much more personal um, guide to some of the work that I outlined in Embodied Social Justice. So um, the, the working title is Embodied Activism. Oh, I love and, it. And it's my hope that um, through, that, through the, that, that piece of work, I'll be able to dig a little deeper into some of the things that we talked about today. Like, so how do you expand somatic bandwidth if you want to do this work in an embodied way? And what does that look like? And what kinds of practices? And what are the territories? So I talk about coming back to our senses as a necessary condition. And I talk about knowing our own body stories mm. and actually articulating our own histories mm. Mm. from mm. our multiple social locations and identifications. And that without an understanding of our own body stories, it can be really difficult to understand the territory that we're navigating through when we're interacting with others. So I talk about mm. that and I talk about liberating our movement and understanding how we can repattern our nonverbal communication with others. I talk mm -hmm. about reclaiming body image, which we didn't talk about today, but which is a really big territory. It's a, it's a major way that we police ourselves and one another around um, particular kinds of differences that have different um, social power dynamics attached to them. And then how do we do that in a relational field? Mm. Oh my gosh. So yes. I'm, I'm wow. very busy writing it and I'm excited about it. So for me, um, just to go back to, I guess what Selena said, how do, I, how do I keep my energy up for this work is there's so much work to do. I just, I, I, I guess I, I, I keep it up by continuing in, to engage and to work with other people and to have these kinds of conversations where I go, yeah, actually, there's a lot here. There's a lot to learn and a lot to do. And I still feel like I'm learning as well. You know, yeah. So um, I'm going to stay on a little bit afterwards. Um, Dr. Cleo Monago and I have another 22nd Century Leaders program starting in April where we support white leaders who want to do this work. Um, we rib each other. We have fun. We go deep. Um, it's going to be a lot uh, less demanding of a structure this time. But if you want to talk about that or anything else, I'll, I'll stay on for another 10 minutes or so afterwards. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm heartened. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jill. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, care. Jill. I'm going to turn off the recording.